everyone. Hi, I'm Sue Giller Lane, the Program and Outreach Coordinator at the Living Well Cancer Resource Center here in Geneva, which is part of Northwestern Medicine. Thank you so much for coming today to today's presentation on fertility and cancer with Dr. Mary Ellen Pavone. Dr. Pavone is an Associate Professor in the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine, and she also serves as the Medical Director of IVS. IVF, I'm sorry. Um, she got her medical education at Boston University School of Medicine, completed her residency at Johns Hopkins University, and her fellowship at the McGaw Medical Center of Northwestern University. We're so grateful to have her here today. Um, but before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, you will be muted throughout this live presentation, but you can ask any questions anytime by clicking the Q&A button, which is to your right of your screen. Uh, Dr. Bravone will answer your questions at the end of her presentation today. This presentation is being recorded and it will also be posted this week on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And you can find both of those on our website at livingwellcrc.org. So thanks so much for coming and we are now ready to welcome Dr. Pavone. Thank you so much, Sue, for the introduction. Um, so today I am going to talk a little bit about fertility after cancer. Um, there is a little caveat. I, I'm a gynecologist and so a lot of this um, is more dealing with the female side of things, but I will allude a little bit to um, male fertility as well. So first of all, we know that cancer treatments do pose risks of infertility um, afterwards, and there are a variety of factors that may influence fertility treatment, fertility rates actually after cancer. Um, and this includes exactly what type of treatment was done, specifically the type and dose of chemotherapy, as well as radiation, um, where the radiation fields were done, the dosage of total radiation that was given. So also uh, any prior treatments, including types of, of surgeries. Um, age is also, is also important. Um, the younger the age and treatment, the more likely uh, women are to have fertility restored, as well as the dosage of the chemotherapy radiation, as I already mentioned, as well as one's gender. So why should we care about fertility after cancer? So we know that fertility in and of itself is a significant concern for many young patients diagnosed with cancer. Um, Partridge et al. Uh, published a study in 2004 that was a web-based survey looking at over 600 patients, and 57% of them reported significant concerns regarding compromised reproductive potential, with 29% reporting that these concerns actually guided their treatment decisions. So patients really care about this. We also know from doing childhood cancer survivor studies, um, looking at survivors versus siblings, that cancer can impact um, fertility and can increase chances of premature ovarian failure, premature ovarian insufficiency. So the reason why I like these types of studies is because there is a um, familial and genetic component of premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, and in the general population, this occurs about 1% of the time. And so what we were, what the study was looking at is, were survivors more at risk for um, infertility as well as premature ovarian insufficiency compared with their siblings? And again, they were looking at siblings because that would have controlled for any genetic um, factors or for many genetic factors. And so what the study found was that survivors were 20% less likely to become pregnant and had about an 8% chance of premature ovarian insufficiency compared to 0.8% chance in siblings. And, you know, in general, we think about 1% of the population is at risk for premature ovarian insufficiency. So this study found 0.8% um, in the sibling, um, matched siblings. So that is pretty um, consistent with what, what we would think. And so in general, um, the cancer survivors were 13 times more likely to have premature ovarian insufficiency compared to their siblings. So in 2006, um, the American Society for Clinical Oncology actually updated their treatment guidelines um, for specifically to deal with um, cancer and fertility. So 
They published a clinical practice guideline on fertility preservation for both adults and children with cancer. And these ASCO guidelines are updated at, at intervals by the update committees. Um, and after review and, and of the analysis and evidence published since 2006, the update panel concluded that the new evidence was actually not compelling enough to warrant substantial changes, but they did make some clarification and updates. So specifically, the guidelines today state that as part of the education and informed consent prior to cancer therapy, that healthcare should address the possibility of infertility with patients treated during their reproductive years or in the case of children with either their parents or guardians and also be prepared to either discuss fertility preservation options or to refer potential patients to appropriate reproductive specialists so we could have that conversation with them. So a little bit of biology basics in terms of women. Um, so as women, um, we are born with the maximum number of eggs that we are ever going to have in our life. And by the time puberty has hit, that number has already decreased. And between the age of, of puberty and menopause, that number continuously declines. However, there are certain things that can make that decline happen even quicker um, than it would naturally, and that includes chemotherapy. So in this graph, what we're seeing is um, that decline of egg number and depending on the type of chemotherapy dosages and the age that it was administered, you can see that that decline of egg number may happen a lot quicker um, than it would just by biology alone. So what is involved in a fertility evaluation? So in general, when patients are less than 35 years old, we recommend one year of unprotected intercourse with um, properly timed intercourse and regular cycles prior to seeing a fertility specialist. However, in patients who are greater than 35 or where we anticipate difficulties, we actually recommend evaluation even sooner. And so these anticipated difficulties do include a history of chemotherapy or radiation exposure or a history of what's called oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. And what that refers to is not getting regular cycles. We also recommend quicker evaluation if we suspect that there may be issues with fallopian tubes. So for example, patients who've had a history of sexually transmitted diseases, we would recommend sooner evaluation. Suspected endometriosis, so suspected um, growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus, that's oftentimes uh, did, uh, with, uh, well, oftentimes patients have very painful periods as the main symptom, or suspected male factor infertility. So this could include if a partner um, has been exposed to cancer therapies as well. And for those patients, we actually recommend evaluation um, sooner than that year mark. So um, about six months or um, even earlier than that. So the evaluation, um, modern day evaluation of fertility includes a semen analysis to look at sperm parameters, documentation of ovulation. So either with um, blood draws of what's called progesterone level. So a hormone that's secreted in the second part of the cycle or with um, having regular cycles. We also do something called ovarian reserve assessment, which I, I will go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Assessment of the uterine cavity, as well as documentation of tubal patency. So sperm analysis has actually been around for quite a while. Um, it was first performed in the 19th century, and especially for initial screening, um, what we do is we take a reproductive history um, as well as kind of any pertinent medical history, including exposures to chemotherapy or radiation. And we generally recommend doing two sperm analyses performed about uh, four weeks apart. And specifically what we're looking at for the sperm analysis is the volume, pH, sperm concentration, motility, and morphology. And what the morphology refers to is the shape of the sperm. And we would have a, a referral to urology placed if we find abnormal 
a reproductive history or any abnormalities in the sperm analysis. Um, we standardly do not recommend doing hormone evaluations um, routinely in men, although if abnormalities in the sperm is found, urologists will typically embark on that. So in 2010, um, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, um, updated new reference values for um, sperm analyses. Um, these were uh, collected from over 4,500 men, and it was from a cohort whose partners had a time to pregnancy of less than 12 months. And so the new sperm, the new normal is considered a sperm volume of 1.5 mLs with a total sperm number of at least 39 million, a vitality of 58% live, a motility, which is the percent moving of 40%, with progressive motility of 32%, and that refers to the forward moving sperm, and a morphology of 4%. So that's 4% normal morphology. So when we're talking about egg factors, um, what we're looking for is an assessment of ovulation. So again, regular monthly cycles and ovarian reserve testing. And so what ovarian reserve testing refers to is trying to figure out the number of eggs in the ovary. And specifically, a decrease in fertility, um, what has been noted to occur in a natural fashion, and a lot of this is thought to be because of a decline in both oocyte number as well as oocyte quality. So what we know from natural populations in which couples reproduce without voluntary restrictions, we know that women tend to reach their peak fertility between ages 20 and 24, and that there is a small decline in fertility from ages 30 to 32, with a much, much steeper decline after age 40. In 1987, um, researcher uh, de developed a term and coined it diminished ovarian reserve. And so what this referred to was women who had an exaggerated gonadotropin response to a test called the clomiphene challenge test. And we do find ovarian reserve helpful in women who have unexplained infertility, older women, or with women who may have um, natural or I iatrogenic decline of eggs because of, again, chemotherapy or radiation. So this is something that we do rely on when evaluating fertility after cancer therapy. The decrease in fertility that we often see in older women is also related to the decreasing quantity of good quality oocytes. And unfortunately, there's not a, a non-invasive test that we can do right now to look for quality. Um, our testing can look at quantity, but not quality. So the ovarian reserve testing that we do is something called a day three FSH and estradiol level. Um, so we have women come in on the third day of their menstrual cycle to check some blood work, including this FSH and estrogen level, and also a test called AMH. And AMH stands for anti-mullerian hormone. And we know that anti-mullerian hormone is related to the onset of menopause and that the levels will decrease as women approach menopause. And we often see decreases in AMH before we see decreases in FSH and estradiol. So it is helpful to have both of these tests done. As reproductive specialists, we also tend to do something called an antral follicle count. And this is a ultrasound, a vaginal ultrasound that's done in the early part of the cycle to look at the number of growing follicles um, or eggs. Um, and we typically do this early on in the cycle. Um, and what we know is that this antral follicle count measurement um, is shown to correlate with, with ovarian responsiveness to hormone treatments that we use for fertility. Other things that we look at in evaluating fertility are uh, tubal patency, um, any type of uterine pathology, um, and there is a lot of controversy in whether in the role of surgery and whether or not surgery should be done, but um, as a as part of diagnosis, as part of diagnosis and potentially therapy. Um, 
And right now, uh, really, we hold off on surgery for diagnosis itself and really um, use surgery only in the realm of therapeutics. So tubal patency can be evaluated either with a test called HSG, which stands for hysterosalpingogram, or with a test called saline hysterosonogram, or SHG or SIS. So a hysterosalpingogram is basically done um, under x-ray, and it's where a doctor will place some water-based dye or oil into the cervix and watch it fill up the uterine cavity and then come out the fallopian tubes. This is uh, a better test for assessing tubal patency, so it's a really good test for ass assessing the patency of your fallopian tubes, not the best test to assess the inside of the uterine cavity. Um, there's also a test called a sonohistogram or SHG, or sometimes also referred to as SIS, saline infused sonogram. This test is considered inferior um, when to look for tubal factors specifically. However, especially in low risk women, so in women where we're not expecting tubal pathology, um, it is a kind of a simpler test. Um, it's something that can be done in the office, so we don't need to refer patients to radiology. And in certain populations can demonstrate tubal patency as high as 80%. So it's a pretty good test to do and fairly non-invasive and overall better tolerated than the HSG test. The gold standard of looking at the inside of the uterine cavity um, is something called hysteroscopy, which is a camera inside the uterus. But oftentimes, as I alluded to, we don't tend to do surgery for a diagnosis. We tend to, to do other things. So for example, a regular transvaginal ultrasound can be, can be done to look for some um, anatomical issues, um, as well as either the SHG or the HSG. Um, personally, I think the SHG does um, give us a little bit better information compared to the HSG with regards to um, uterine cavity evaluation. And so that tends to be what we do first line to look at both the inside of the uterine cavity as well as fallopian tubes. So once that a standard evaluation is done, then we talk about treatment options. And treatment options, if everything looks normal, can include um, continuing um, timing of intercourse. And we would kind of talk about how to best um, time intercourse or could include things including medicated intrauterine inseminations or IUI or IVF in vitro fertilization. So this next picture kind of shows uh, what an intrauterine insemination is and most of the times we tend to use IUI along with medications and many of the medications that we use are to help increase the number of eggs that a woman is ovulating during any given month. Um, so what happens naturally during any given cycle is that women start to recruit a whole cohort of eggs. Um, those are the eggs that we see on the, f during the antral follicle count ultrasound. And then because of, of hormones, one will ovulate and the rest will die off. And so what we're doing when we're giving medications for intrauterine insemination is giving some minimal hormonal support to potentially help grow more than one of those eggs and help them to ovulate. And so in a way, what we're doing is helping increase the number of eggs that a woman is ovulating. And then the actual insemination itself will place the sperm directly into the uterus um, to help minimize the distance that the sperm has to travel. And this can also help with certain side effects that some of the fertility medications have. Um, certain fertility medications can thicken the mucus in the cervix and otherwise make it harder for sperm to penetrate, um, which is another potential benefit of using the IUI. IUI is a quick office procedure, again, done um, right around the time of ovulation, where with a speculum, so very similar to um, a pap smear, there's a little teeny little straw that's placed directly into the cervix and into the um, opening of the uterus, and then the sperm is um, is injected. Um, the procedure itself takes maybe about two minutes, and then generally we have patients rest for about 10 minutes before getting up and going on um, the rest of their day. Another potential treatment option is something called in vitro fertilization or IVF. 
And what this entails is going through an IVF cycle and either fertilizing the eggs to create embryos or potentially to freeze eggs unfertilized. Newer techniques for freezing eggs give almost equivalent success rates in terms of thaw survival as embryos. And so egg freezing is a very viable option um, for either uh, women who aren't partnered um, or who don't have ethical or rel religious um, restraint of creating embryos. Um, so a lot of times when we talk about eggs versus embryos, those are the factors that we take into account. Is the patient partnered? Um, is the relationship stable? Um, because you know, if embryos are created, those embryos would legally belong to both the uh, biological mother and father, um, as well as any ethical or religious concerns. And also if genetic testing needs to be done, and we'll get into this in a little bit of time, but the genetic testing can really only be done on embryos. Um, so that's another potential factor. So what is involved in an IVF cycle? So there's various components, including the ovarian stimulation, the actual egg retrieval itself, fertilization if embryos are being created, embryo transfer if the goal is pregnancy versus um, freezing embryos if the idea is fertility preservation, uh, or freezing eggs if, if embryos are not created. And then at some point, the thaw and transfer of those frozen gametes into either one's own uterus or potentially a gestational carrier if one's own uterus is not a, a viable option. So many times the stimulation protocol that we use, especially for fertility preservation or even for standard IVF is something called an antagonist protocol. And especially when we are not looking to transfer embryos right away and, and we're freezing them, we can do either a cycle specific start or a random start. And so what cycle specific means is very early on in the cycle, as opposed to a random start, which just means that we start gonadotropins any time in the cycle, irrespective of, of menstruation or ovulation. It involves about eight to 14 days worth of self-administered injection medications um, that we would give you instructions on how to give. And then we also do monitoring with blood work and ultrasound somewhere usually about five to eight times over that two week period of time. So um, women will come in about five to eight times every time they come in, blood work and ultrasound, and then we would contact um, patients later that day with any medication changes that we're making, how everything is looking on ultrasound, and the next time that we want to see them in the office. Most of this monitoring is done very early in the morning, as so to not interfere with one's work day. The actual egg retrieval itself is done under conscious sedation. So it's done under IV sedation. Um, and we have a um, ultrasound suite in our in our office um, in, in the lab and pavilion in downtown Northwestern. So um, for that visit, um, for the egg retrieval, uh, people would have to come downtown for that. And like I said, it's done under ultrasound guidance um, with anesthesia on board. And it's usually done about 36 hours after what's called the trigger shot. So the last injection that a woman would give themselves is the trigger shot and the actual egg retrieval is done about 36 hours after that. Um, there is a vaginal probe that you can see in the image um, that has a specific needle guide that's attached with a 17 gauge needle. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit bigger than the needles that you would use, for example, for a blood draw. And what we do is we enter the follicle with that needle. So you can see this image here. Um, this is the follicle and aspirate the follicular fluid as well as hopefully that egg. And you can see that one single cell of the egg that the embryology lab would then identify under the microscope. And we would let patients know how many total eggs that we got before they leave. And if fertilization is being done, um, that, would, that report would be given the next day. So here I have a little video that hopefully will upload.
Um, and this is basically a video of an egg retrieval being done. Um, and so what we're seeing here are the follicles on ultrasound, and there's the needle that goes directly into that follicle, and that fluid is being aspirated. And once completely aspirated, then we'll go on to the next follicle, and so on and so forth. And so this procedure takes maybe about uh, 10 minutes 50, or maximum of about 15 or 20 minutes, really depending on how many follicles there are to aspirate, um, as well as kind of any potentially um, anatomical factors that could make the procedure um, a little bit more difficult. So for example, if a woman has um, uterine fibroids that are large, that are blocking access to the ovaries, that might entail a little bit of, of a more difficult procedure. Um, but in general, procedures take about 10 to 15 minutes and um, we get results back right away as to how many eggs um, we're, we were able to achieve. So next, if eggs are being fertilized, um, that would ha that happen later that same day um, in the embryology lab. And this is a picture of what an egg looks like. And this is kind of a schematic of sperm fertilizing the egg. Um, these two are schematics. And then potentially there's also a procedure called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which can be done for either low sperm counts, or a lot of times we will do that if we're using frozen sperm. So for example, if a male partner froze sperm prior to cancer therapy and we were using that, um, we would generally use a procedure where that where one sperm is directly injected into the egg um, for fertilization to occur. Once fertilization has successfully occurred, we would expect to see something called a 2PN um, on the day after the egg retrieval or a zygote. And so what the 2PN is referring to are two nuclei. And so if you look very carefully here, you can see one cell here and the second cell here. So that's a 2PN. And then from there, the embryos are grown in the lab um, prior to either freeze or embryo transfer. So this is again, that single oocyte, and this is the zygote with the two nuclei. And this is a four cell embryo. So in an ideally um, dividing embryo, um, the, the embryo would go from two cells to four cells to eight cells, and then to what's called a morula, which at this point has hundreds of cells. And then lastly, a blastocyst. And we tend to freeze embryos at either the zygote stage, the eight cell embryo stage, or day three embryo stage, or blastocyst stage, really depending on how many embryos we get, how many fertilize, and, and ultimately um, how the embryos are growing inside of the lab. So in cases where we're gonna be doing embryo transfer, embryo transfer is actually very similar to that intrauterine insemination procedure. So um, it is done under ultrasound guidance. And again, there's a speculum placed with a little straw that goes into the uterus to drop the embryo. Um, that procedure generally is very quick. It takes maybe about five or 10 minutes. Um, it can be longer if there's you know, um, some complications with getting the catheter inside of the uterus, but it's generally a very fast procedure. And we tend to place the embryo towards the top of the uterine cavity and pregnancy would tend to happen if successful. Implant, early implantation tends to happen um, several days after the embryo transfer if successful. So how successful is IVF? Um, the most recent um, IVF success rates are published from 2018, and this is looking at most fertility centers within the U.S. Um, we all, most fertility centers report to an organization called SART, as well as the CDC. And what SART does is, um, it stands for the Society for Assist Assisted Reproductive Techniques or Technology, and what they do is they compile um, all of the success rates from various clinics and then can come up with overall live birth rates in the U.S. And so what we see is that the overall live birth rate is most related to a woman's age um, because, again, that is most related to ovarian quality. And so in success rates for women who are less than 35 tend to be very good at almost 50 percent. 
with lower success rates as women get older. And by 42, success rates are, are less than 5%. So again, that significant um, decline, especially after age 40. How many embryos are transferred? It tends to depend on the age of the, of the egg. Um, as well as the embryo quality. So for example, if women undergo fertility preservation prior to cancer therapy at age, say 30, and then come back at age 38 for embryo transfer, those eggs are always age 30. And so in that case, uh, with a favorable prognosis, we would recommend transferring embryos back one at a time with a more guarded prognosis in someone, again, whose eggs are age less than 30, we would generally recommend no more than two. And you can see that these numbers do increase as, as women get older, again, because of quality of embryos. And if successful, um, we hope to see a intrauterine pregnancy. Um, and generally, we can start to see things on ultrasound um, when women are just about six weeks pregnant. Um, and a little bit more on ultrasound uh, closer to seven or eight weeks. And so what this is looking at is a vaginal ultrasound, and this is the uterus here with the what's called gestational sac and the amniotic sac, which is surrounding um, the embryo itself, and then the fetus or the what becomes the baby um, is right over here. And we would hope to see a heartbeat in a healthily developing pre pregnancy. So, you know, I talked about giving yourself hormones. I talked about the actual egg retrieval itself. So are there complications or risks associated with IVF? Um, so the answer is yes, but overall, this is a very, very safe and well-tolerated procedure. So there is about a 1% risk of, of something called ovarian hyperstimulation or, or OHSS. This is what I refer to as an over-responding to the stimulation medications, where the, after the egg retrieval itself, um, women can develop some fluid inside of the abdomen, um, and their ovaries can, mean, can remain very enlarged. This tends to become worse if patients get pregnant, um, and tends to be very short-lived if patients don't. Um, so a lot of times if we think that patients are going to develop OHSS, what we do is we recommend what's called a freeze-all. So we don't, we do, um, we do the egg retrieval, create embryos, but do not transfer an egg transfer back the embryo. There's also specific risks associated with the retrieval procedure, including bleeding, infection, or damage to nearby organs that happen less than one in a thousand. So overall, again, very safe procedure. There may be an increased chance of certain pregnancy complications, including blood pressure complications, um, placental complications, and higher chance of needing a C-section. And because of these potential pregnancy complications, babies born from IVF do tend to be born a little bit smaller and a little bit earlier than naturally conceived pregnancies. Birth defects in the general population happen about um, three to four percent of the time and very slightly higher with IVF. So the rate is about 3.6% um, to 4.5%. So very, very slightly higher with um, in vitro fertilization um, conceived pregnancies. And what a large study has actually showed is that this is likely the same rate as patients with infertility that were able to conceive naturally. So we're pretty sure that birth defects aren't because of the IVF technology in and of itself. It's most likely related to underlying infertility, especially when we're talking about fertility preservation or, or freezing embryos, there is a chance that um, the embryos would not freeze or thaw properly. And I will talk about this genetic testing that can be done um, in a few minutes, um, but if genetic testing is done, there can be false positive or false negative rates, as well as the chance of having no normal embryos. So for certain women, carrying a pregnancy is not is cannot be done um, for either uterine fracture reasons or for example if patients have breast cancer and are on tamoxifen and can't come off of the tamoxifen or some women have had um, radiation uh, to the uterus and can't conceive or some women have had cancers to the uterus and don't no longer have a uterus and for these reasons in Illinois, um, it is legal to use what's called a gestational carrier. 
And this can either be um, someone who's known. So for example, a family or a friend, or um, we can go through agencies to help recruit um, someone to be a gestational carrier. Um, it is important to note that it is very expensive. Um, it ends up costing about 80 to $100,000. Um, a lot of this expense is actually because there has to be a spe specific medical plan that's bought for the gestational carrier. Her own insurance wouldn't cover the uh, pregnancy-related costs. And it is not legal in all states. So if you are not living in Illinois, you'll want to see if um, using a gestational surrogate or a gestational carrier is something that your state allows. So I've mentioned several times that we'll be talking about genetic testing um, that can be done. And so in terms of timing of genetic testing, there are certain genetic testing that can be done preconception. Um, it's just something called genetic carrier screening, where we're looking to see if um, patients are silent carriers of certain genetic disorders, or um, it could be done in terms of, of looking for dominant conditions too. So for example, there are certain um, dominant conditions that can pose increased risk for cancer. So for example, um, early if women have breast cancer at a very early age, many times they are screened for BRCA gene, for example. And so that is something that would be done kind of as part of cancer therapy um, or can be done during preconception. There's also something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic testing that can be done before the embryo is transferred in, in IVF um, pregnancies. Um, genetic testing can also be done prenatally, so doing something called a chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis where blood or amniotic fluid is taken from the pregnancy um, and tested, or postnatally where the baby uh, after being born can be tested to see if they have any genetic abnormalities. So this is an example of what embryos look like under the microscope. And what you can see is that many of these embryos kind of look more or less the same. And it, it, even with uh, trained embryologist eyes, it's hard to tell which one would be genetically normal and which ones would not be genetically normal. And so the, the idea is, in, with doing this pre-implantation genetic testing is to test for genetic abnormalities prior to transferring the embryos. And this can either be testing for specific diseases, for example, cystic fibrosis or um, cancer mutations, for example, BRCA, or it can also be done to detect what's called aneuploidy. So these are chromosomal um, abnormalities in, um, in the embryos. So this was first done in 1990, so it is a very new technology. And by 2003, there had been over a thousand um, live births using this technology. And in our practice, about 40% of our IVF cycles are actually using this technology. So it can be done to look for single gene defects, um, and that would be something called PGTM. It can also be done to look for aneuploidy, and that's something called PGTA. Oftentimes we will do this with patients who have failed several IVF cycles or who have recurrent pregnancy loss. So patients who are having early miscarriages, um, we will do that as well as to look to help select embryos. So it can help select the embryo that has the greatest implantation potential, or potentially, again, select embryo that doesn't have certain genetic abnormalities, for example, the BRCA gene mutation. So the, um, the biopsy is done. In our practice, we do what's called blastocyst biopsy. Um, and so there is a, using these microscopic, um, instruments under the microscope, there, uh, one of the embryologists will take um, a sample from the um, embryo. Um, I think I had a video, but it's not showing up, so we'll just go on to the next slide. So this was a study looking at um, attitudes 
uh, surrounding pre-implantation genetic testing amongst patients who had hereditary cancer syndromes. And so specifically what this study looked at was um, sending a survey to almost a thousand adults who had a known hereditary breast cancer or ovarian cancer or Lynch syndrome or um, some other genetic abnormality or some, um, some other genetic associated cancers and to see did they agree with this technology? Um, should, it, should we even be offering it and should it be used? There was about a 38% um, response rate and 28% of the patients who responded said that using this technology has impacted their own family planning. 24% were aware of this technology that can be offered. 72% um, said that PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so again, looking for that single gene mutation, is something that should be offered. 43% said that they would consider using this technology, and 29% were uncertain. Um, you know, this technology um, sometimes can be covered by insurance, um, and other times it's not and um, sometimes can cost an additional three to five thousand dollars on top of the cost for fertility treatment. So that is of course something that also needs to be considered um, when um, thinking about these um, genetic testing op options that can be done. So my last slide has some websites um, to go to to either learn more about the things that I have um, talked about today. Um, there is also the something called the Chicago Coalition for Family Building, and this offers grant opportunities um, either in the form of IVF cycles or money to help with the cost of gestational carrier or um, even egg donation or adoption um, for all families that are trying to be built using fertility, um, who, are, who are having infertility um, with special kind of money allocated for patients with a history of cancer. So this is something that if, uh, that patients can definitely access as well. And then I also have here the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is the governing body for um, fertility doctors as well as ASCO, which is, again, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, where you can look up their um, latest and greatest recommendations. This is the fertility line. So this is manned by Kristen Smith, um, who is our wonderful fertility preservation patient navigator. Um, and she can certainly help with any fertility related questions or getting appointments for either patients diagnosed with cancer uh, who need to undergo fertility treatments prior to uh, cancer therapy or for patients who are survivors um, and trying to assess their fertility. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Pravone, for that presentation. A lot of great information and resources um, that you shared. Uh, a few questions. Um, how long should someone wait to conceive after treatment? And would this be different for uh, a woman versus a man? Yeah, so that's a great question. And unfortunately, there isn't a blanket um, recommendation for that because a lot of that depends on exactly what type of cancer therapy was used, um, if it was radiation, if it was chemotherapy, and how long specifically the half-lives of those cancer therapies are. Um, and that is definitely something to discuss with the medical oncologist or whoever you are working with um, for your cancer therapy because they will be able to give you specific guidelines based on what your specific treatment regimen is. All right. The other question is, as a woman, will having children um, cause the cancer to come back? Great question. So we actually did um, a, a study here at Northwestern that looked at something a little bit differently. Um, we actually looked at women who had undergone fertility preservation um, 
compared to women who had and, and looked at fertility at, at cancer recurrence as well as, as ultimate mortality and found no increase of cancer recurrence or um, dying from cancer in women who chose to do fertility preservation. And then in terms of, of pregnancy, um, lots of studies, especially with breast cancer, have actually shown that cancer is not more likely to recur in women who get pregnant. And it actually appears to be um, somewhat protective, especially with, uh, with breast cancer. Um, so the majority of cancers um, would not be at increased risk for recurring because of all the extra hormones during um, pregnancy. And some, um, it may even provide some protection against recurrence. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pavone. Thank um, you. Next question, um, is there any reason to avoid sex during cancer treatment? Well, not all cancer treatments stop ovulation or sperm production. And so there is a very real chance of becoming pregnant um, during cancer therapy or even prior to cancer therapy. And Obviously, if one is pregnant, um, many times the chemotherapy or radiation therapy can't proceed. Um, so it is generally not, it's not, not rec it's not recommended to not have sex, but it is recommended to use protection. Um, and whether that is in the form of um, barrier protection, like a condom or hormonal protection, all depends on um, the type of, of cancer therapy and what the oncologist thinks of using hormonal birth control uh, during cancer therapy. But in general, we do recommend using birth control. Okay, um, I think this is the last question. Um, who and when um, should I talk, who should I talk to on my care team about fertility preservation? And when do you recommend that? I recommend doing it as soon as possible. And you can certainly bring it up to anybody on your care team. So your oncologist, maybe your oncologist nurse, or if you're working with a radiation oncologist, even a radiation oncologist, or in terms of, you know, surgeon, the surgeon, and they can either give you information themselves or refer you um, to someone who can, or there is this great hotline here um, that patients are more than welcome to directly call and we can help um, facilitate that conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bavon. That was that was really informative. And um, I really just want to thank you for, for visiting and for sharing your expertise today. Um, I also want to thank everyone out there for joining uh, the Living Well Medi Medi uh, medical presentation today. And please do make sure that you visit our website, livingwellcrc.org, because we have all of our fall programs and services online right now, and they're free to anyone with a cancer diagnosis, as well as their caregivers and family members. Um, thanks again and have a great rest of your week. Thanks everybody.